We're having a little bit of technical difficulties tonight, I think. That's okay. Um, I'm Tracy Stevens. I'm the program director, and I want to welcome all of you to um, our second Otter Spotter webinar, um, along with the field scope, Jessica Bean, and the River Otter Ecology product, Project, Megan Isidore and Terrence Carroll. Um, we're excited to have you all joining us again this week to learn more about becoming an otter spotter. Um, Friends of the Verde River, as many of you may be familiar with, and some of you may be not. Um, we're a nonprofit located in central Arizona in the Cottonwood area, and we work on watershed issues in the Verde River system and want to see a healthy flowing Verde River. And part of that includes learning more about the, the animals that we share this ecosystem with. Um, do you want to go to the next slide, Jessica? Yep, let me. <laughs> Apologies, it's loaded. Okay. I'm not sure what, there it goes. <laughs> and just to orient those of you who may, may not be local to Arizona, um, the Verde watershed is located in the central area. As you can see, there's a red arrow pointed to that green basin. Um, you can go to the next slide. The watershed covers over 6,600 square miles and 190 river miles. Um, it's one of the last perennial flowing stretches or rivers in Arizona. Um, so we feel it's a very important system to work on. And we divide it up into several different regions shown here. And as I said, um, Friends is located in Cottonwood, one of the central areas. And I know um, at least one of you is coming to us from Clarkdale tonight, which is also in kind of the middle Verde section. And then I know we have some some folks from out of state as well. So um, we're excited to have you all here and learn more about how to help us learn more about our Verde River otters. And Jessica, if you wanna um, go from there, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Tracy, to Tracy and Nancy for helping us set this up and um, and work with your community. So my name is Jessica Bean. Um, I'm actually based at UC Berkeley and I partner with a project called FieldScope um, that is a community and citizen science platform for collecting and analyzing data. So this new project about spotting river otters on the Verde um, is, is hosted on FieldScope and we're really uh, excited to offer this opportunity um, to us as a community to collect and analyze river otter data in Arizona. So this is the home page um, on the FieldScope platform, and I'll put the link in the chat in a little bit. Um, but this number has actually gone up. We have some more people signing up for the project, and we actually have one official observation so far. We have some test observations in there as we were testing out the platform, and we'll show, we're really excited to show you um, that new that observation that was already logged within our Otter Spotter FieldScope Arizona project. So today we're all we're going to review how to submit otter observations. If you joined us last time, we quickly went through this at the end of our session with Megan, where we learned all about otters and otter behavior and ecology. Um, and we're going to still explore some of that today. Um, we're going to be looking at some data, especially from California to learn more about river otters and where they're found and what they do. And we're going to see some really cute photos and videos of otters, which I'm very excited about. Um, Megan and Terrence and the River Otter Ecology Project group have some amazing, an amazing library of resources and data in the form of photos and videos. And we're gonna discuss observations and share questions. So we're hoping that you won't be shy and that you'll be unmuting yourself and putting your ideas in the chat as we explore some otter data and videos today. And I see someone, oh, there we go. All right, so just to, again, for some of you, this might be a recap from last time, but for those of you who are joining us for the first time or just need a review, FieldScope is a browser-based data collection platform. It is not an app. So you will go to a website address in order to log your data. Um, so there's nothing you have to download and it also can work on your phone. Um, we also have an offline mode. So if you happen to call up FieldScope on your phone before you go into a region where there is no connectivity, when you reconnect, that data will actually be automatically uploaded. So um, it's, again, you don't have to download anything. It's just on the internet. Um, we'll give you the, the address um, shortly. So you will need to create an account with FieldScope to enter data, and I'm going to show you, um, again, how to do that. 
Um, if you're working with a particular group or an organization, or you even just have a community group or a neighborhood of people, feel free to all use the same login. Um, you don't need to necessarily make a new account if you're working within a, a, you know, a community group or an organization. Um, but the idea is that if you have a login, there's a way for me or for us potentially to get in contact with you if we have questions about your data. Um, but your name and your email, that all remains private. But we really love to be able to reach out to um, to people if there are questions about the data that they've logged. And just to be again to let you know, we work with a lot of school students with field school um, or uh, school groups and students. So we're very concerned about privacy um, and making sure that that information does not become public because we do work with students. Any questions so far about field scope and what it does? Okay, so we're gonna dive in now and I'm gonna give you an overview to how you go in now and log your otter sightings. So the first thing you're gonna have to do is you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna click that login. You're gonna go to this home page for the project and you can click login in the upper right-hand corner. When you do that, it will take you to this page where you're asked to sign in. But if this is the first time that you're signing in, you're gonna click create an account. So this is very similar to other websites where you create an account using your name and your email. And so there's some very standard information that FieldScope asks you to fill out. You do create a username, you enter your email and your password, your first and last name, and your school or your organization. You could just be a community member. You don't need to have a school or an organization necessarily. And then you will sign up. You will receive an email um, to that email address that you entered here, and you will go into that email and click a link in that email in order to fully activate your account. If you don't receive that email or you can't find it, always check you know, your trash or your spam folder, um, but also email us if there's any problem and you can't find your confirmation email from FieldScope. So again, pretty standard process for signing up. And then again, you can share those login credentials with other community members or colleagues who you're working with within particular organizations if you don't want everyone to have to create their own login. Once you're actually logged in, you will see your email address appear in the upper right hand corner. So this is my email address um, and this is my account that's logged in here. And also once you're logged in, you will be able to see this add data button that's next to your email address. So once you're logged in, you can click that add data button in order to log your otter sighting, which is super exciting. Okay, so the first thing you wanna do is make sure you're telling us where you saw that otter and of course, to be as accurate as possible. So you can actually search for the name of the location um, where that otter was located if you want to. You can also drag and drop this map on a point um, I'll show you how to do that in a second. But the first thing you can do is if you want to search for what's the closest thing to where you are. So for example, if you saw an otter at Dead Horse Ranch State Park, you can start entering that name and it will automatically start to populate and you can select um, what option you um, would, would be most appropriate for logging that otter observation. So I'm gonna select Dead Horse Ranch State Park. I think there were some observations that we, um, we saw last week that were, uh, that were actually made there. And then what you can do is you can zoom in. So it'll, it'll put a point on the map, but it'll still be pretty zoomed out. So it's very helpful to click that plus button as much as you, as much as you can in order to zoom in as much as possible and find that exact location of where you are. So here are some roads that you can see running uh, Dead Horse Ranch Road, and here's a little creek or stream. So this is just a test observation, but I just put that dot near that creek and to indicate that that is where I saw that otter. All right. Um, any questions so far? Okay. So yes. then if you see yes. oh, yes. Martha. Um, yep, so I'm not good at seeing otters, but I have a lot of friends that you know see otters or might want to. So I put it on Facebook and say, um, if you see any otters, let me know. Okay. And so then from there I say, tell me exactly where you saw them, what the date was, all of that stuff. And then I um communicate through my own login name and stuff what I saw um, because I see it more valuable 
collecting information from others because uh, I don't ever seem to see them. Um, so I think that's more valuable to encourage others to tell me what they saw. That's, I mean, I think that's great. If you feel like you can be the touch point for other people in your community and actually log the data, um, Megan and Terrence, feel free to, to chime in if you feel differently. But as long as we can get back in touch with you, if there are any questions about the data, and then you can get back in touch with your community members, um, I think that could work. So location and date, not necessarily photographs. Photographs are not required. So I'm in a second, I'll go over exactly what is required when you log an observation. That's a really great question, Marsha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And any other questions or comments at this point? So, so far I've just showed you how to log in and then get your observation point on the map in field scope. Okay. So as you scroll down the data form on field scope, it will ask you to select your observation date. This is one of their, uh, additionally, the, one of the required fields. You must put the latitude and longitude, the observation date, and then finally, the number of otters that you have seen. These are the three required pieces of data um, that you must enter in order to log an observation. So okay. you can see there. Longitude and latitude. <laughs> That's my next question. Sorry, say it again. Longitude and latitude. How do I know where we are? Yep. So when you find that spot on that map that indicates where you're from, where, where that otter was seen, it will populate that longitude and latitude location. And so, so, if you, so if I'm not at Dead Horse and I'm three miles upstream, from TAPCO, um, I'll be able to find that. Yes, you can look at the map, you can zoom in and out to find the exact location. Okay. And then you would drag that point to the, the closest spot you can find. And then that will the longitude and latitude for that spot will read here. Okay, so this map is all about the Birdie River. So how far does it extend upstream? How far does it extend downstream? It will, you can actually zoom, zoom pretty far out to all of Arizona. <laughs> okay, so okay, got it. Anywhere in Arizona, you could submit data. Yep. Yep. And alternatively, if you are someone who has the, the you know, a GPS mm -hmm. or has the coordinates, mm -hmm. the longitude, latitude, you could also enter them manually here and just enter the numbers. Okay. But most people, I suspect, um, will just be using the map to find the location for where their observation is on the map. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Great questions. Any others? Okay. So again, the three required things are that you find your location, right? That you select the date. When did you see that otter? What day? And then how many otters did you see or did you think you see because you saw because counting otters is a whole other <laughs> art <laughs> um, and skill. So um, which we will we will talk about later. Um, but yes, so important that you log that number of, of otters. Now there's a lot of other really interesting information though that you can provide us that will tell us more about otters in Arizona. So if you can provide some of those other information, that would be great. And again, don't feel like you have to provide all of it, um, but if you could at least provide some of it, that would be really wonderful. So for example, the general location, let's just add a little more descriptive text about where you saw the otter. What's the location type? So was this a creek? Was this part of the river? Um, was this in a park? Um, actually not at a, a in, you know, on land in a creek, right? So um, different places that you can, you can specify within general location and location type. Okay, so again, as you keep scrolling down, there are questions like, what time of day was the otter seen? Um, are you sure that you saw an otter? How sure are you? Can you distinguish adults from pups? So were there obviously smaller individuals um, in the group of otters that you might have seen? And then it might ask, and then it can ask you how many adults and how many pups, if you happen to be able to count them. Other questions include things about otter behavior. So like, 
describe the pup size relative to the adult size and then the swimming were they swimming were they foraging seeking food were they feeding on fish or crayfish or crabs or birds um we'll see some amazing videos later today of them doing some of these things and then some information too about you know, describe yourself. Um, who are you? Are you an educator? Are you a naturalist? Are you a community member? Um, any other ideas or um, suggestions that you have? And then there is a section for the photos and the video. And this is actually really important. And I know that River Otter Ecology Project loves to get photos and videos of the otter observations that are being uh, logged. So here you can choose a file and then once you um, select a file, it will show you that photo um, and show you that it has been uploaded and you can add a label or a description um, and then that will be saved along with the rest of your observation. If you have any issues logging, um, logging those, um, that, that information, uploading the photo or uploading the video, please feel free to email me and we will figure it out and we will make sure that your photos and your video get uploaded um, and logged with your um, with your observation. Um, we can go back in and edit data. That's the beautiful thing about, about field scope. And if you communicate with us, we can go in and make sure that everything is there that you want to be there. Any questions about that? Jessica, um, yeah. your screen or the sharing is really out of focus for me really yeah so I don't know no I don't know what to do about that but it's, it's out of focus for me too so sorry um we're gonna switch in just a second actually maybe maybe we should switch now Megan do you do you want to switch now and you can share your screen and see if it's better and uh Jessica yes. I I also have a question um are photographs um required I know it's great to have photographs or videos, but can you log um, a sighting um, without a photo? Yes, please log sightings even without photos. Um, yes, as I said, we love to have photos and videos, but it is not required. The only thing that are required are the location, finding that spot on the map, the number of otters, and the date that the otters were seen. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good question though. Yeah, just want to reiterate, don't feel like you have to have a video or a photo or even a good video or a photo. <laughs> so, so hopefully this will be better. Sorry again for the, the fuzziness on my screen. What slide are you on, Jessica? We are on slide 23. 23, thank you. Hi, everybody. It's Megan here. I'm so sorry. We're having a little bit of um, issues. Uh, let's look at this. Let's go to slide 24. And looks see, better. Does that look better? That looks okay to me. What about everyone else? Let's try a video. Let's, uh, this is not one we should try. Let's try this video. It's much better. Thank you. Is okay, that better? Good. You're not in slide presentation, no, Meg. I, okay, thank you. Let me stop share again and, and make sure I'm doing this correctly. Hang on, everybody. Thank you, Megan. Sorry about this. <laughs> ah, it happens. Okay, we're good. Let me get into the slide presentation. And we were on 23, and I'm sorry to interrupt sorry. everybody. We'll move on now. Okay, so hopefully everyone can read that slide now. Um, or sorry, Megan, you're about to put it in the view. There we go. Thanks, Megan. Okay, so you can see how that otter photo is attached there. You can see it. You can, like, there's like a little thumbnail of it, and you can always delete it if you pick the wrong photo, and you can upload multiple photos. So also don't be afraid of sending us lots of photos of the <laughs> tops of otter heads. <laughs> I have done that before to Megan and Terrence. I'm like, here are three really bad photos <laughs> of an otter. Not that bad I photos. <laughs> 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 so um again photos are not required but we love to have them and they're super useful for understanding where those otters were seen and if making sure that you know that is is an otter so um okay so Megan if you want to go to the next slide so once you log your data 
it will be visible in field scope. Um, that being said, Megan will be going in to make sure that it's um, official data, that, she, that she's reviewing it, and that it's been reviewed um, by River Otter Ecology Project. Um, so, but your, your data will appear right away if you go to that data tab that's circled up at the top. And you can also see your data point on the map. It will appear um, immediately. And okay, if, we if we have questions about it, we'll just get in touch with you and ask you. So not to yes. worry. Don't worry about what you send in. Yep. Next slide, Megan. So um, you can also click on to see other observations. So the default is that you'll see your own observation first. But if you want to see all the other observations that have been submitted, you can then click to this tab that says all observations, and you'll be able to see the other data points that have been submitted. By people in um, into field scope for Otter Spotter. Next slide. And you can also see that data in a table. So you can toggle that little bar back and forth from table to map, depending on how you want to view your data or review your data. Next slide. So as I said, please, please, please reach out with any questions. We are happy to help you and make sure that your data is submitted into field scope accurately. Um, I'm putting the link to the field scope page in the chat as well as my email. Um, so again, please feel free to reach out to us and let us know if we can help you in any way to make this happen or make this easier. Any questions? We'll pause here. Any questions about submitting data to field scope for Otter Spotter? because we did have our first official <laughs> field scope Arizona otter data submitted. So this was at West Clear Creek at the Maxwell Trailhead area. Has anyone been there? I'm curious if anyone on the call has been there. Well, it looked like an absolutely beautiful spot. Megan, I don't know if you wanna to try to play the video on the next slide, if it's there. There was a video and an image submitted with this otter sighting, which is very cool. It may not play very, it may not, it may play. not play. I'm sorry, okay. this was when I, I wasn't able to switch out. <laughs> That's okay. But you can see that it was taken in this beautiful canyon. <laughs> And we do have we do have the video on our Facebook page. We put it up on Facebook already. So check out our Facebook page and you can see it. That's awesome. So what you'll see is this otter popping up out of the water next to that canyon wall, which was very cool to see. And again, very different terrain than I've seen otters in, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which was exciting. Okay, so at this point, I'll turn it over to you, Megan, briefly, just to... Okay, I'll just reintroduce myself really quickly. I'm Megan. I'm the co-founder and executive director of River Otter Ecology Project. And we support watershed conservation. That is our goal, our mission, and our reason for being. And we do it using, of course, river otters, because who doesn't love them? So we do we do it using um, community science like Otter Spotter and, and field science as well, and advocacy and education projects. And um, I think that's all I have for the moment. Great. Well, thanks, Megan. So what we'd love to do with the time that we have together today is also really dive into our otter data um, and also tell you the story of the California otters, because we think that exploring the data from California will also help us understand how we're going to use and explore the data in Arizona once we have more data. So Megan started this work about 10 years ago. And at that time, this was the California River Otter Range map um, that existed. And we're curious, and feel free to put your ideas in the chat or unmute yourself. What do you notice and what do you wonder about this range map that you see here? And just to situate you, um, when we started our project, we lived here on the map. You can see Point Reyes National Seashore jutting out from above um, 
from above San Francisco, from above the San Francisco Bay, Bay. And we were living right about here at the end of Tamales Bay. And we were looking at this range map and we were not seeing river otters. However, we had seen river otters in the creek right by our house. So Marsha asked a great question. Are there more otters today or more data? <laughs> That's a great question. A what great do we mean? Question. Yeah. What do we mean by more data? I'm curious. Marsha or someone else wants to chime in. In fact, that was the first question that we asked. <laughs> yeah, well, um, easier to speak than write. Um, yeah, because I know the next map will show that there's a wider range because I was at the last um, webinar. Um, and I was talking to a friend today, and she, you know, I, I said that, and she said, well, are there more otters? Are they expanding their range? Are they more healthy? Um, and they're growing and, and all this stuff, or it's just, you know, it's, it's great to have more data or more people seeing them by awareness and, and writing it down and communicating it, um, or is it a little bit of both? These are all great questions. Any others that people wanna build on top of those questions and thoughts from Marsha? Are there more otters today? I mean, are they expanding the range that we know of? That's a really, really good question. And that's the question we started to, out to answer because we were down here, way out of otter range down here, near Point Bays. And here's the otter range way up in Sonoma County, which is the county north of ours. And we thought, why aren't we seeing river otters all around the San Francisco Bay area? And we knew that they had been here historically because we looked at records, but suddenly they were gone. So that brought up questions, made us wonder. But didn't you find a lot of otters in San Francisco Bay? Wasn't that part of the last webinar? Um, we did. Yeah. yeah. And we can move on, I think, Jessica. Yeah. So let's show them the next slide. So. This is a, Megan gets it. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah. <laughs> sitting go here ahead. waiting for Jessica to move on. No, it's all good. There we go. Um, so we have entered a sample of the river otter data um, into FieldScope. And these are crowdsourced observations from 2015 to 2018. So earlier on when, when Megan was collecting data. So what we see here, which we already talked about in the last webinar, but we want you to notice um, is that of course, some of these are observations are clearly outside the range, the, the um, established range, which is in that blue shade. Um, so what, what else do we notice and what else do we wonder about these observations that you're seeing now on this map? Obviously they were outside of the range that was expected. So yeah, because people found them, like we're gonna try to find them. <laughs> Right. So yes. Yeah, so they're outside of the range. Any other questions about where they're found outside of the range or why they're find out, found outside of the range? I think what, one of our first questions about this range that we found when we looked at the maps was that big dot at the south in the south part of San Francisco Bay. There's a big dot of otter range. And we thought, well, what's that all about? We had never heard of any otters down in the South Bay before. And we, when we looked into what that was, it, it turned out to be a, a sort of a spurious sighting. It was some tracker found an otter footprint or what he thought was an otter footprint down there in, night. I forget what year it was. Terrence right, might remember it was in the early 1900s, I think. And they so they decided that that was part of Otter Range. However, we had not seen any sightings there. 
for a long time. So that really brings up questions. It brought us, for us, it, it made us think, wow, I wonder how accurate this range map is to start with. And that's why we started Otter Spotter, because we said, you know, we have no idea really where the otters are or where they were or how they moved. So, so many questions. <laughs> so many questions. And Eliz also added that um, about thinking that the populations have increased to be able to observe them outside the ranges, too, so that it's about not just where they are, but the numbers of them, potentially. So figuring figuring that out or and wondering about that. All right, so I think we can go forward to the next slide, which is one of these amazing videos. So again, these were some of the sightings that Megan, this is a video for that Megan took. This is, yeah, this is a video I took with my cell phone because, <laughs> and it was a couple of years ago and I just have to show it because it cracks me up. It's a bunch of otters and they were at my study site. I happened to be sitting right at their latrine site, literally on their poop, changing a camera out. And the otters decided to be really interested in me. One of the things about otters is that if they're fairly used to people not bothering them too much, they're very curious. And they especially wanted to know why I was hanging out at their latrine site. So they all came to visit me. <laughs> it just cracks me up because they were so much fun. And I ended up having to actually stand up and move back because they would have come right up to me. They were so surprisingly bold. And of course, you don't want to ever encourage wildlife to come up and visit you too closely. And so I did stand up and I moved back and they um, went up and gave us some good sniffs at my backpack and my camera and thankfully did not choose to poop on those. <laughs> so that's that story. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Megan. Sure. And this one. I think we showed this last time, but it's always worth showing again. Very curious otters. This is in a wetland also in Point Reyes National Seashore, and this is a seasonal wetland. And it did. It wasn't always seasonal. It used to stay wet all year, although it got a lot lower than it was than it is in the spring. But um, last year and the year before, it completely dried by May or June. So the otters had to move, and um, that's something we think about a lot. It's one of our questions about otters is what about climate change? What about the long droughts? What about um, places like Arizona where the droughts last a really long time and can be really severe? Um, what does that do to otter range and the range for other species? So it's, a, it's important information that we need to know and, and doing camera trapping for river otters or for any other species is very, very handy to um, find out what that means for species. So as we can see there, <laughs> we're filling in that map some more. We added again, another sample of the river otter observations that were crowdsourced from 2015 all the way to 2023 now. Um, what do you notice and what do you wonder now about this map and where you're seeing some of these sightings pop up? Anyone notice what happened in that blob down at the southern end of the bay? <laughs> Do you want to tell us that story, Megan? <laughs> I will. This is a great story because I think it may have been our very first um, otter spotter sighting that we got in. Someone sent us a photo of a river otter in the South Bay. And at that point, we didn't really we didn't know how rare that was. And we just thought, oh good, th there are river otters down there in the South Bay. But then months and months and went, months went by and the other areas of San Francisco Bay, the North Bay, the East Bay started to fill in. And we started to think, wow, it's pretty rare to, to see river otters down there. And that just brought so many questions up into our minds which we have been working on answering for the past 11 years. <laughs>
Wonderful. Any other noticings or wonderings that any of you are making about this map? Think about the um, population den population densities in the San Francisco Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland, Richmond, the North Bay, all of these places are really, really densely populated everywhere around San Francisco Bay. I would consider it densely populated. So we started to wonder, are otters really such a wildland species? Or could they be a link between wildlands and urban lands? And what does that tell us? I think, Megan, if you want to go forward to the next slide. So these are some of the quest, you know, we've come up with a lot of questions now based on what we've seen of the data. Um, oh, and Karen's wondering, similar to the red fox, some ot or otters similar to the red fox in that way, Megan. As far as being urban species, Karen, is that what you're asking? Um, as far as being somewhat of a link between urban and rural areas and more wild, um, I remember I lived in um, Massachusetts in a somewhat, I always called it sub sub urban area. And we had a lot of wetlands and we saw red fox quite a bit um, just crossing our property. And yeah. I always wondered about them, you know, they're having, getting access to food that, you know, maybe the gar kind of like raccoons and foraging for things that people leave out. Um, so I've, when you said, um, are they are they a link between um, urban areas and more wild areas? And just maybe think of the red fox. That's that's a really interesting link to make the red fox and the raccoon and the river otter because they have really different habitat requirements. All each of those three species has different habitat requirements, but they also have some similarities. And the one major difference that I see there is that um, river otters have a really different diet than red foxes or gray foxes, which is um, more what we have here, although we do have red here, but, um, and raccoons. Raccoons can eat pretty much anything and foxes can eat a lot of foods too. River otters are carnivores. They can only eat meats. They don't eat any kind of plant material. So they're kind of, and they mostly eat fish in all places, fish or crayfish is the largest part of their diet. So as far as being urban creatures, they can do really well in urban areas as we can see by the map. Let me move on to the, oh, let me go backwards to that last map. So you see in these urban areas, even there was even a river otter found in San Francisco. It's not shown on this map, but, um, in our first year of being in business, a river otter was seen in San Francisco, which made our project really famous because we were the only people studying river otters in the San Francisco Bay Area or in most of Central California. So we knew about three things about river otters and the news people were calling us up all the time. What about this otter in San Francisco? So, but that was really cool because it made it made our project really famous and people started sending in their, our, their sightings. So we started to really fill in this map. And what we found was that even cities like Oakland and the East Bay, Berkeley, Richmond, we had river otters coming and visiting all of those places, not necessarily living in the cities, but visiting um, and going up and down small creeks, through lakes, through streams. So I, I think that, that what we finally came to realize was that river otters can in fact do well with a dense population of humans, which is information that we as humans living in ever more dense populations around cities, around wildlands, really need to get that information out there so people understand how we can conserve wildland areas, even surrounded by a lot of people so that wildlife can live and survive and even thrive like they do here. And Megan, I know we were talking last week about uh, and wondering like if the Arizona otters are gonna have similar behaviors, are they gonna be going into 
these densely urban um, habitats and and we don't know that yet right like we don't yes. have the data yeah I wonder that I'm really excited to see what we find out about um, places like um, like uh, Phoenix Tempe and Phoenix the places down at the south end of the Verde River into the Salt River I think there was one sighting in the Salt River that is on our um, Verde River map so I can't wait to see what we get and the more, you know, what's really important to us and for our project, the most important thing was getting that word out. It was word of mouth from people telling their friends, telling their friends who are birders, their friends who are naturalists, telling people on kayak trips, just let people know about this project and that they can input their sightings. And then you'll see them pop up on the um, Verde River map in field scope as well. And we're so thrilled that you're here to help us collect that data and help us tell these stories. Yeah. So we're going to go a little bit deeper now, I think, into the data and exploring the data in different ways. Um, and so, again, we've come up with a lot of questions, but we want to let you know that, of course, when you collect the data, like we have, like Megan and her group has in the San Francisco Bay Area, there are all these different thing, you know, bits of information that they are collecting over all these years. So again, that required data of where's the otter, the observation date, and how many total otters are you observing? But then there's all this other information that we can gather um, along with it. So we're going to focus in on just a, on a, some of these things today and what some of this data can help us understand and the stories we can tell with the data that is collected. So Megan, if you want to go to the next slide. So for example, what can we learn from where otters are found? What can we learn from when otters are found? What's that observation date that you're logging? And then again, how many total otters did you observe? And then also how many adults versus pups? And then potentially that otter behavior. So we're gonna dive into some data and we're gonna look at data about otter swimming and feeding on crabs and crayfish and fish and birds and if, otters were walking or rolling or vocalizing when they were observed by the otter spotters. So the great thing about field scope is that you can pretty quickly create a lot of different types of data visualizations, especially maps and graphs, um, like bar graphs that allow us to explore some of these questions and figure out what can we learn with the data collected and what can they tell us about what otters are doing. Okay, so Want to talk about this one, Megan? <laughs> yeah, I chose this one because it's that this is my my lesson to everyone on how river otters can cross a six lane highway without being hit by cars. This is um, in a really industrialized, really busy area that is um, cut. It there's a six lane lane highway that goes between the otter homeland, more or less and where they hunt and a wetland where they hunt that's connected to um, a large ocean strait where they can catch big prey. And the otters do really well here, but the only reason they do really well is because they are connected. That Those two watersheds are connected by a huge um, pipe that goes under the river. And it wasn't put there for the otters. That um, was put there, I think, for flooding purposes, but the otters and many, many other animals use it. We've seen raccoons, we've seen even turkeys going through this pipe, but it gets them under the highway. So it's pretty good. So again, if we look at this otter map, this otter spotter map, and then Megan, if you go to the next map, we're gonna sort of zoom in on some different sections of this map and also show you some different ways of looking at this data. So we're gonna give you some zoomed in views from both this Northern area, North of San Francisco, and also in within the Bay itself in San Francisco and the East Bay. So if you go to the next map, Megan, what this shows is the land cover type. So what is that land where those otters were spotted? And again, at this resolution, you kind of have to zoom in some more, which you can in field scope um, if you make this kind of map. But it'll tell you, is this you know, developed land? Is this forest? Is this grassland? What are we seeing and where are the otters located? So let's zoom in on one of those areas north of San Francisco, Megan. We can go to that next slide. 
So what do we notice about this map? I find this one really interesting. And again, look at that legend on the side to figure out what that land cover is, where those otters are located. What patterns or what, um, yeah, what distribution do we see of where otters are located? So feel free to share your ideas in the chat or even unmute yourself if you'd like to share your thoughts. But what is this telling us about those otters? And I think it's probably stuff that we've already talked about before that you've said yourselves, but what does this tell us about where otters live? Okay, I'm confused because it's equally divided as far as I can tell between medium intensity developed and being out on evergreen forest. So I guess they can live anywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Does anyone agree with those ideas? Liz is saying different landscapes dependent upon different food sources. Oh, interesting. So, but do we know that? What kind of data would we need to understand their food sources in different places? That's a really great idea, Liz. Any, any other thoughts and responses? Well, oh, I would want to know um, when you look at where they are in the medium intensity developed area, and, and then comparing that to the evergreen forest, what's the waterway that they're going in in the city? Um, and what kinds of foods are they eating there? Are they just eating pretty much everything? Um, is it different? I mean, how does it differ? What kind of competition do they have for food and places to stay, you know, like their places to hide out and places to, um, are they having their young there or are they just going there to eat? Um, those are things that I wonder about because to me, it seems like the forest would be a safer place to stay. Um, but, you know, those are just my off the top of my head. These are fantastic questions and some of the same questions that I know Megan has pursued. Um, Megan, do you want to talk briefly about the SCAT um, analysis, which I think you touched on last time as well, but talking about coming back to prey and how we know what they eat. Sure. Um, when we started, our understanding was that river otters mostly ate fish and crayfish, and then also other kinds of, um, of arthropods for the most part. What we didn't realize was actually how many birds they eat. They eat tons of water birds and they eat water birds seasonally. River otters have a high, um, energy, high, high energy needs. They need to eat a lot of food, about 17% of their body weight every day to remain in good shape. They need to find their food mostly in the water or around the water. So they're very hungry animals. They're lean animals. They don't carry a lot of fat on their bodies. They need to keep their, um, their um, energy needs. Their energy needs are high and they need to keep those up. So they'll eat almost any kind of meat that they can get their little teeth around from arthropods, insects, to um, crayfish, to mussels, to clams, to um, voles, moles rats if they can get them, which they, they don't often. It's mostly water-based animals. They also eat everything much larger up to, um, up to sharks, small sharks, um, big fish out in the ocean. What we found was we had denser populations of river otters in general along our coastlines. And that's because they can hunt in the shallow waters of the coast and get much bigger prey than they can in rivers where they mostly eat fish of any size that they can get and crayfish. And what was interesting, one, one of the many interesting things we found was that in a um, wetland where, that, uh, where the otters were going under the six lane highway, there's a wetland there that is 
absolutely full of um, invasive crayfish and non-native crayfish from um, that hang out in our area. And that was almost 100% of their diet because those crayfish are slow and they're easy to catch. So what we found through all of our diet studies and our scat studies is that river otters will eat what they can get. They take what's most um, plentiful and slowest moving. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing, Megan. I love all these stories <laughs> that, yeah. that these data trigger <laughs> and are connected to. That's great. So maybe should we look at the next map now? Because I really also find this one interesting. And this tells you more about where they're capable of living. <laughs> yeah. So look at those cities. That That's uh, Marin County on the left, where I live. And that's very um, densely populated along the bay side. And also look at the, this is the East Bay of San Francisco Bay, very, very crowded, just chock full of millions of people. And river otters are very happily ensconced there. And then you can see there's a, there's a horseshoe of otter sightings here. And this is Contra Costa. Eastern Contra Costa is very built up. It's very, um, it's full of oil, companies and, and chemical companies and uh, oil tankers come in and pick up oil there and move oil around. It's You wouldn't expect for river otters to be happy there, but there it is connected to um, the strait and there is tons of big fish in the strait and river otters swim through all of these waterways and they do really well there. And we, we have a whole presentation on that, which we'll do for you sometime. It's really fun about how the otters use these very built up, very industrialized areas to great effect. Because river otters' middle name is adaptability. They're really adaptable. And as long as they can, as long as they have reasonably clean water, the ability to get food and just enough of the right kind of habitat to survive, they're, they're perfectly happy to live in someone's boathouse or, you know, in someone's backyard where they don't even realize the otters are there. Awesome. Any questions about what you're seeing on this map? Well, I think it's time to show some more of those videos of otters living in different places. <laughs> I think so, too. I'm not sure this one is going to show, but I have some other ones. Yeah, unfortunately, we weren't able to get all of those videos input, but I have more. That's okay. Those weren't working. Do you want me to carry on? Yeah, yeah. Let's just keep going and we're going to get to some more videos really shortly. shortly. So again, some of the other data that you can help us collect will help us do things like this, like create a map of where otters are located, but then also thinking about what's the tree canopy. This is a layer that shows the density of the trees in different places. So where are otters located? Do they like being in the trees or are they also okay being out in the open? So if we zoom in on that northern area again um, in the next slide, what do we notice about where otters are relative to the trees in this part of Northern California. Where there's trees, there's water is what I'm thinking. <laughs> oh, interesting. So we're expecting that the there would be otters where there's water, so there would also definitely be trees. Maybe. What about Maybe. in downtown Santa Rosa, which is this area right here? Lots of otter sightings, but not too much tree cover. I grew up in Santa Rosa, and I can tell you that there's very little tree cover in those parts of Santa Rosa. So these otters are walking around in areas and potentially swimming in areas where there really isn't a dense riparian habitat next to those creeks and streams, yeah. which I find really interesting. And I can tell you that as a kid, the only place that I saw a river otter growing up in this region was in that densely forested area in the upper left. Um, so it's really interesting to me to think of them as coming into Santa Rosa now. <laughs> 
um, in these more open areas. Yeah. And I, what well, one, it did really surprise me to find how many otters are coastal and just are so happy to live in coastal scrub, basically, and go fishing in the water. And Jessica's been out otter spotting with me out at one of my study sites. And um, she saw, you, you saw what it was like, that big wide beach and no trees at all. And lots of happy otters. Lots of happy otters and lots of evidence of happy otters all yeah. over the place as well. <laughs> yeah, and tracks. Yep. And bird, uh, bird uh, carcasses and or lots of bird skeletons. Carcasses. Yeah. Um, so again, another zoomed in look at San Francisco, the area around San Francisco and the East Bay. And again, you can see that a lot of these areas do not have dense tree cover and yet lots of otter sightings, which is really fascinating. And, okay. So here are just some of, some of the areas that we normally see otters. Here's otters on the beach. And I really love this. It's one of the few um, photos, this photo at the top left. It's um it's a mother with her three pups and she's still nursing them. You can see they're pretty big, but she still has prominent nipples from nursing. It's awesome. I love that. And the one on the top right is actually where I showed Jessica the otters and the signs of otters. And there's me sitting on the beach and I see lots of coastal scrub out there, but no trees, lots of rocks, coastal scrub, no trees in evidence. This is the, bot. oops backwards. The bottom left is a grassland outside of Sacramento, and you can see the um, um, somebody help me. <laughs> I've lost my words again. The uh, the birds. Oh, the cranes. Thank you. <laughs> sandhill sand cranes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. You can see sure. the sandhill cranes out there and the otters running across the field. And that really surprised me too. There are There is a lot of water out there. There are a lot of um, wetlands and so on. But those two otters running across a field in front of a bunch of cranes just cracked me up. And then the one on the bottom right, of course, is another otter running where there are no trees and this time getting rid of coyote. Priceless. And that actually brings up another point, which is that river otters are not especially afraid of almost anything. They're easily killed by mountain lions, by wolves. Um, I'm not sure that you have much else. I don't know what you have in Arizona that would kill a a uh, river otter. Coyotes will, if, if they attack in a pack, they can definitely take a river otter. But if it's just one or even a couple of coyotes, the river otters will chase them off. They're very fierce. Do any of you know, put it in the chat, do, you, do any of you know of any other animals that might take a river otter? In Arizona? I'm sorry, I meant in Arizona. A bear. A bear. Bears could, for sure. Um, they'd have to be quick, though. But river otters, for their size, are stunningly fierce. I mean, I, t I told you last week, I think about the sharks and the otters and, and the pelicans and the otters and the eagles and the otters. They're amazing. Yeah, mountain lions, puma can certainly kill otters. One of my um, research buddies had her study site up in in uh, northern Washington. Um, her her study otters were killed by a puma one year. So for sure, Marsha. Okay, do you want to move on to when? What time of year otters seen? That are otters seen? That's another question we have. Yeah. So you know that's some of the again important data that we get when you submit that required data is when. What's the date when that otter was seen? 
And this one I just put up because it's obviously snowy and obviously not the San Francisco Bay Area. This was the famous um, Yellowstone River otters who I think if, if you look up on YouTube, Yellowstone um, River otters and coyotes, you can see an amazing chase between coyotes trying to kill and eat a river otter and it did uh, make it through, which was nice, at least for the otter, not so much for them. Maybe go forward one more, Megan, and this will give us that that. So in California in the San Francisco Bay Area, this is what we saw in terms from the data that's in field scope um, about the count of observations that was seen throughout the year. And through my discussions with Megan, what I did learn is that this made sense in terms of the pattern that we would expect of when people are seeing more otters or less otters throughout the year. Does anyone have any guesses why there would be this? pattern of this increase in the late summer and into fall? And why is it so low in February, especially? Marcia says babies. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone agree with Marcia? What about babies? <laughs> <laughs> Baby otters are just the cutest. <laughs> so Megan, tell us about when and why we would see more otters in late I summer. I was so happy to see this um, graph pop up and Jessica said, hey, this doesn't look like it's the it, it's right. This this looks like it might not be the right graph. And I said, no, no, it's it exactly shows what we see. Because here, river otters have their young in February, mostly February and March, and sometimes into April. So when, when they are sequestered in dens with their babies, they're not seen as often. Mother river otters are very secretive about where they have their babies, and they go to great lengths to make sure that they're not seen very much during those times. So they are definitely still going out and hunting and catching food. And as their babies grow, and once they start to wean, they um, bring the food back to the den for them. But they're usually not really out much with their young until June, July, August, and then September and October and November, all the families are out playing and having a great time and learning to hunt. So that's the why that that's why that graph changes through the months. Thanks, Megan. It's really interesting. Thinking about those otter life cycles. And we're, I mean, do we expect that it might be the same in Arizona then? Or is it possible that there's a slightly different seasonality to their behavior? I am interested in finding that out because I don't know the answer to that question. And I think over time we will we will get an answer to it if we get enough people um putting sightings in. Wonderful. You, um, river otter pups are born by latitude. So that's considerably south, but not so, so much south that I think there would be a big difference, but the weather is so different mm -hmm. there than here. And I also wonder, you know, that brings us to a really good question about these data. And that is um, that it's really dependent upon people being out and spotting otters and reporting them. So if it's a hundred degrees outside, I don't know how much people are gonna be out in the hottest of the summer days and looking finding otters. So that's a really interesting difference that we'll see what we'll see how that goes. Or do the otters change their behavior with the temperature and and also where the water is? So yeah. those are some questions that we've had. Yeah. All right. Well I Marcia think it's... says we'll be on the river more during May through September. That's good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you see a ton of otters. Exciting. Any other questions or thoughts about the seasons in which we might see otters and why? And Elizabeth asks a little bit of detail about breeding and river otter breeding is really interesting. Females don't necessarily have pups every year. It depends upon um, how they're doing and and I don't know what else it depends on, but probably more than that that we don't know about but they can have pups every year. Females can start breeding when they're two years old. 
but they usually don't um, breed until at least two or older. Males um, are able to breed when they're two, but they usually don't breed until they're four or older. And that's because they have a penis bone which has to grow long enough to be able to hold to hold to um, hold on to the female when they when they do breed. So they're usually they usually wait till they're larger to breed. Um, uh, what else was I going to say about that? Also, females have uh, delayed implantation, which means that they um, their egg is fertilized when they mate, but then the egg doesn't implant and start growing for about 10 months. So they have babies, they'll have their young, and then two weeks after they give birth, they can go back into estrus. And that may also, I just thought of this actually, that may also have a, um, some effect on whether they breed every year or not. So, but they do go back into estrus two weeks after giving birth, which means that they are feeding their young in their den, they're nursing their young in the den. They're also actively mating with male river otter for two or three days at a time. So they have a lot of energetic, um, demands upon them at that time. It's really interesting to me. And nobody knows exactly why they have delayed implantation. Marsh is saying like zebras. What's similar in zebras? I don't know about zebras. I don't know about zebras either. So if you go to out of Africa, you will learn that zebras are always pregnant. <laughs> and it sounds like zebras are always pregnant because as soon as they give birth, bam, the male is right there immediately. Um, which is, you know, kind of, it, it shocked me. And my students from junior high were kind of interested in that <laughs> idea for sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so did they have delayed in, implantation as well? Or did they? I don't, know, I don't remember that part. I just oh, remember okay. that they were, you know, as soon as, I just can't imagine, you've just given birth and then hello, buddy, you know, here you are again. Um, that just seems rude and from a human <laughs> perspective. <laughs> Go away, dude. No, actually. No, I've been through that already, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, female river otters often don't seem to be enjoying the process at all, and they'll fight and bite and scream and try to get away. So you may have something there. <laughs> so we have some more videos. And we have this question, which we can also answer with our data about, are otters seen alone or in groups, right? How many otters do you see at any one time? So where was this one taken, Megan? This was in um, uh, Rodeo Lagoon. It's, it's just on the north side of the Golden Gate Bridge, just across the river, uh, the um, bay from San Francisco. It's in a Golden Gate National Recreation Area, and it's one of our best otter sites. Oh, and Eliz had some questions about males and females, and if the males provide food. Oh, huh. you just lost your... I know, I'm sorry. It just okay. disappeared. Why did that happen? Ah, there it is. Um, what was the question? Do males provide food? No. Yeah, or do the females, <laughs> or, you know, in the den, or do the females have to do the hunting as well? The females do everything, and the males, I'm looking for my chat. I can't find it. Oh, that's so annoying. Hang on a sec. There it is. All right. Um, no, the, the males are not invited when the females have young in the den. The males can be like lions and kill pups. So they're absolutely persona non grata while, while the pups are little. However, and this is really interesting, once the um, pups get bigger in October, November, September sometimes, but more into October, November here, the pups are big, they're able to look out for themselves, they're re really busy learning to hunt with their mothers. They, they are still with their mothers, but the males sometimes return and are not chased off by the mothers at that time. 
So it, it seems like the mothers are extra protective when the young are little. And that's actually good for the Verde River folks to know if you're out kayaking or swimming and you see a mother with pups, it's good to really keep your distance and keep an eye out because those mothers are very, very fierce. And they are, there's generally no problem, but there have been a few instances. It happens once in a while, every couple of years, I'll hear of someone attacked by a river otter in a river while kayaking or swimming. And it's almost always, every time that I've heard of, it's during the spring when the mothers have little pups. And I suspect that's what's going on there. So just something to know, you don't have to be afraid of them. They're not gonna run after you and attack, but just it's good to be aware if there are pups around or if it's early summer. So this is an activity that Megan and I love to do. And we want you to tell us how many otters do you see in this video? Can you count them? <laughs> And also how many are pups and how many are adults, just to make it impossible. All right, so what did we get? Feel free to unmute yourself or put your thoughts in the chat. Marcia says two adults and six pups. I'm gonna ask Terrence to be the, the um, person who knows the answer to this, if you do Terrence. I'm not sure Terrence and I ever completely figured it out. <laughs> one, two, I see two pups and one adult there. That and that, I'm not sure. I think that's two pups and one adult. So that's two adult, adults and four pups. Am I right, Terrence? Uh, yes, some days I, some days there are three pups and some days there are four. <laughs> that's three, and that's another adult and another pup. It's hard to tell though, it's really, this is a really good example of how difficult it can be. Not so much to count them because they're all going across, you can count them, but to be really positive if you're seeing a couple of adults, a couple of pups and the females, um, female otters will hang out together. Sibling uh, related females will hang out together with their associated pups. And this is a good example of that. This was at least two, if not three adults with their pups with them. But we have another counting one coming up. <laughs> Yay. Jessica, just to make you happy. <laughs> so this is a map we were able to make in field scope, again, showing how many river otters were observed with e in each of these observations. So you can say, see that it sort of varies between one and about nine or 10 otters in any one place. So if you want to go to the next slide, Megan, we can zoom in on part of the map we were looking at before. So what do you notice about how, where, where are the total, where, how the total number of river otters observed varies across this map? Is, are there any patterns or is there anything that, that you can learn from this? There's something that sticks out to me right away, and I I need to look further into the, the a particular sighting on this map. Mm. Does it does anything stick out to anybody else? It's hard, it's a hard question without really knowing what the city of Santa Rosa is like, but it's a big city. I am surprised how many larger groups of otters were seen in Santa Rosa yeah. <laughs> in that urban area. That was surprising to me. That's a little surprising to me too. Um, the The biggest number looks like eight. It looks like they saw eight. And a couple things spring to mind here. One is that it's really hard to count otters. 
And especially when they're in a big group, it's easy to count them twice. It's easy to not count enough. <laughs> Um, so not don't worry too much if you're not entirely sure how many otters you're seeing. It's okay. Again, this is information that we gather over time and we're able to use um, the large aggregates of the data much more effectively than we can by just looking at one sighting or even this um, group of sightings. It's not that many. So the other thing that really interests me about this is that, oh no, this is on the Napa River. That's not surprising actually. So that's the main thing that surprises me is that such a big group was seen in the busy city of Santa Rosa. And I, I wonder if people were seeing that many otters or they thought they were, or there really were that many, anything could be true. What do we see on the next slide? Cause we'll look at the San Francisco area now. But this one's interesting too, because there are some mm -hmm. big groups of otters like in that Contra Costa Canal area that, but I guess yeah. we saw a video earlier that showed some of those, an otter family in that canal. So that makes sense that some of those sightings were reported there. Yeah. And that, that canal is such a, it's such a great place for otters because a lot of it is fenced. So they're protected from people. And yet they can go all the way to the Carquina Strait and get those big fish that, um, and there are also tons and tons of crayfish in that canal. So it's all kind of good for them there and it shows. And plus people, uh, some of those sightings are, the, there are so many sightings there. And think about this too, is because there are so many people who walk along that towpath and they, they all report the otters because one of the things that has come out um, that has happened with us through Otter Spotter is that we've started a program called Otter Ambassadors where, and we just started it last year, where we're sending trained docents out to otter hotspots and, um, and to help people understand how to be good wildlife viewers, why watersheds are so important, the real conservation method, I mean, message, gets out there really well when you start walking around talking to people and talking to them about what they're seeing right there in their local neighborhoods. So I think we're hoping that some of you will end up being your otter ambassadors in Arizona and supporting your communities to make those observations in some of these areas. Yeah, it's really fun. Our volunteers are excited about it. And th the three of our volunteers who live in that area and know it very well and know where the otters are, are out there all the time. And they, last year was our first year and they probably talked to about 300 people over the course of just one summer to fall, which is a, that's a pretty good amount of people for a tiny project that has no budget or anything else going for it. But we really got the word out. Great. Well, I think we're ready for another otter video. Is there one coming up? Oh, this is our favorite, Count the Otters. <laughs> <laughs> Count the Otters. <laughs> Don't count any twice. Anybody have a guess? And and we have to be fair. Um, we've ugh, this happened again. Why is that happening? Um, it took us I don't know how many times of counting these otters to more or less figure it out. <laughs> I was guessing five, five or six. Anyone agree? Nancy says five. Marsh says five. Okay. Terrence, that's your site. How many otters? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I would go with five, but some days I go with six on this one. <laughs> So one, one of the things that we do is we, this is not 
otter spotter data, of course. This is our camera trap data. And one of the great things about having a camera trap up over a season is that we get many, many, many videos of otter families. So again, it's um, over the course of time, we really figure out what's happening. So this is some data that we actually put together in field scope to look at the number of otters observed for all these different observations. So what you can see here is that most more observations than others, right, were were counts of one one otter. <laughs> one otter was seen, but that we do have a number of observations with two, three, four, five, six, and all the way up to nine that are represented in this data set. So that's really cool to see that there are these really large groups that people were seeing. So these are, again, observations reported um, by otter spotters and not the camera trap data. Yep. All right. And so we wanted to show you hopefully some more videos of otters and groups and alone. And I think I remember you telling me the story here, Megan, that one of these is an adult helper female who's living with a mom and her pups. <laughs> yeah. You can see the two adults and two pups, is that right? That's right. So the, the helper female is probably the lower one who's making sure the little ones don't fall. And the little ones are doing what young otters do, which is stick as close to their mother as they possibly can. And you can see how agile river otters are. And you can imagine how easy it is them, for them to go between watersheds. So they can swim in the ocean, they can climb cliffs, they can go in um, rivers, lakes, streams, any kind of water. They're totally happy to do that. They can also run for 25 miles between watersheds. So they're pretty astonishingly um, adaptable animals. They can go anywhere and do anything. And if you ask them, they are the first ones to tell you that that's true. I'm sorry to say that Jessica wasn't able to get this one to come in. That's all good. But again, you know, as we get more data coming in from Arizona, we can ask questions like how many pups do we see with each observation and what's that distribution look like? So for the otter spotter data that's in field scope, the, you know, the maximum number was five that was seen, but some people said they didn't know. Because <laughs> again, sometimes it can be really hard to distinguish adults from pups. And then if you go to the next slide, we can also look at counts of how many adults. So I found this one interesting, Megan, because there were some sightings that indicated that maybe all of them were pups. There were a couple of, of uh, uh, yeah, a couple of zeros <laughs> there, that there were zero adults, but that there must have been some pups there that people were seeing. Is that well, how you interpret this? It's possible. Um, it doesn't happen often. Usually the young are with their mothers, but otters are so small in actuality that I think sometimes when people see a, a juvenile otter or an almost grown otter, they mistake it for a pup because they're that small generally. So I don't know. Um, it's not normal for little pups to be out without their mothers, but as the, I would look at what month that, that sighting was. So if it was August or September, very possible to see one. Also, the pups do sometimes get lost from their moms for a little while. Two of, two of our volunteers were at the canal la a couple summers ago and a little pup got separated from its mom. It actually fell down um, a steep, a steep uh, concrete uh, facing, facement thing and it couldn't get back up and its mother could not get down to get it. So the pup was screaming and my um, our volunteers had to save it, of course. So. <laughs> They ran, they, they made their way down into the canal completely illegally, but they managed to do it. And what they were planning on doing was putting a, um, a ramp up so the pup could run up, run up the ramp. And they were both kind of terrified because if the mother ran down the ramp, they would kind of be in trouble with that little pup. And then this pup that probably weighed all of seven pounds ran after them. <laughs> <laughs> screaming. So I have, I actually have video of them running down the canal, trying to escape from this frightening little tiny otter pup, but they really didn't want to get between the pup and its mom. So 
in the end, they did manage to put the ramp up and, and the pup, the mother ran down the ramp and picked up her pup and took it away. So it was a happy story. But pups do sometimes get lost from their mom. So it's possible that they may see a little one by themselves. Interesting. Yeah. So I know we're coming close to the end of our webinar, but there were just a few other things we wanted to show you about otter behavior and some of the things you might expect to see when you're out there looking for otters on the Verity. Yeah, chasing birds, possibly. <laughs> the one on the right, I really like because you can see how lean and strong river otters are. Yeah. They're like one, one giant muscle mass. Look how tough that guy is chasing the eagle. So, in the otter spotter data that's in field scope, we were able to figure out that most of those observations were otters were swimming, um, at least for part of the observation, which is really cool um, to be able to visualize in all of these different environments that are listed across the bottom of the graph. And also in a lot of them, if you go to the next slide, a lot of them were also rolling around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is all the green observations were where otters were rolling and they were also walking if you go to the next slide so again that these otters are being seen in the water and on land and rolling around um, and then we can also ask questions about what were they eating and what else were they doing so you'll notice we, I think we showed you last time that that otters eat birds right and so in some of those lagoon and lake observations people noted that they were eating birds um, which is pretty crazy and eating crabs and crayfish all the green observations and then finally fish of course um, which is a big part of their diet in a lot of places and then finally, the last uh, behavior that I wanted to call out was vocalizing. And I thought this was really interesting that, you know, we heard a lot of those sounds on those videos, but that, that in all these places, people were hearing the otters as well as seeing them engage in different behaviors. So I thought that was great. So again, we'd love to hear about if you hear the otters <laughs> when yes. you make your otter spotter observations. Yes, and if you're taking videos um, and you, we can get the uh, whatever vocalizations they're making, that would be great too. Oh, okay. okay, so I think we have some videos that we can end our time together with. Yeah, these they did these did, weren't. Yeah, I didn't have time okay. to bring those in, but we have the fish. So here's a here's a typical otter eating a fish, but here's one of an otter eating a um, a uh, a. a ray it's actually a, a thornback ray really slow easy to catch otters love the um fish like that yeah i'm sorry these videos aren't going to show that's okay well i think we're actually closing in on our our end of time end of the webinar so we're just so glad that you were able to join us um and if you just want to show that last slide megan with our contact info so again oh, sorry please... about that Let oh that's okay just wanted to remind you, please feel free to reach out. If we can help in any way to support you in reporting your otter sightings and getting your data into field scope or answer any questions that you have um, about both entering the data and about the otters that you're seeing, we would love to hear from you. So yeah, um, I've got one final question. Is yeah. it possible to record sightings of otter slides and um, poop and you know, other evidence besides just seeing them um, because we may not see that many, but the evidence of them might be helpful. That, you know, that's, that's a good question. If, if you see otter poop or tracks, you're welcome to send them, but I should let you know that they're very difficult to say 100% whether it's otter or something else when it's just a photo it's really hard to photograph tracks. However, I don't want to discourage you. So by all means, if you see tracks or scat that you're pretty sure is otter, then send it along and just don't be too disappointed if we if we say, well, we're, we did our best, but we're not quite sure what that is. 
So, and if you do send photos of scattered tracks, try to get not just definitely get close ups of them, but also try to get the surrounding area. Like what, what is the habitat around them like? And if it's a track, if there's more than one track, if we can get a whole row of tracks, that really helps us too. Great question. But again, want to thank Friends of the Verity River for having us and collaborating with us on this project. And we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you all so much. And feel free to get in touch.